the larger question of can we organize? I mean, we I could talk about that for a long time, um, but I do think that it's important that the central institutions of organized labor, like the AFLCO, get behind the idea that we need to turn around the decline in union density, and doing that means dramatically more, dramatically more. Uh, resources and money invested in organizing than we than we have now, you know, by a scale of 10. Um, and we, fundamentally, we need ambition at the center of the labor movement. And I don't think we have that today. You see it in certain pockets, certain unions, but you don't see it at the core of the labor movement. And that does hold us goal, doesn't it? Well, hello, powerful people, and uh, welcome to this very special Q&A and book talk uh, with Hamilton Nolan. It's brought to you by the Power at Work blog and the Burns Center for Social Change and the Massachusetts State House Employees Union. My name is Seth Harris. I'm a senior fellow at the Burns Center, uh, and I'm joined by Thomas Pelkey from the State House Employees Union. We're both going to ask uh, Hamilton questions. We're not going to, we didn't put him in the middle, so we'll pepper him and so we'll have to sort of swivel. <laughs> It'll be just a straightforward series of questions uh, for him. We're going to try to save some time for questions from our in house, in person audience. Sorry, audience at home. Uh, you can send, a, you can make comments on the Power at Work blog and we'll pass them along to Hamilton. Um, you'll notice that we're recording tonight, so every now and then I'll give a wink and a nod to our audience that's watching on the blog. Um, and uh, with that, let me let me just give Thomas a chance to tell you a little bit about the Massachusetts State House Employees Union. First, though, I want to give a shout out local twenty two twenty two IBEW, which is the parent organization. Go ahead, give it up. Parent organization, State House Employees Union. I could have let Thomas do that, but I wanted to get the round of applause. I'll be blunt with you. Go ahead, Thomas. Sure. Uh, thanks again to IBEW local twenty two twenty two. Uh, I'm Thomas Pelkey. I'm a staffer, a political staffer at the Massachusetts State House, which is our state capital, of course. Uh, I've been there for two years now. I'm also part of the State House um, drive to unionize uh, legislative staff. Um, and it's because there's issues at our workplace that we want to deal with. Uh, you know, these include high employee turnover, um, unequal compensation, and even harassment and abuse. And a union, of course, is one of the best ways to address uh, those matters in the workplace. Um, so we've been organizing. Uh, the union just celebrated its two year anniversary. Um, that's when we went public with the unionization effort. Uh, there's the, the state house is actually two separate employers, which is a little bit tricky. So we have parallel union drives, one for the Senate and one for the House of Representatives. The Senate. Uh, actually got a majority of union authorization cards pretty quickly, about four months it took. Um, they presented that majority to the Senate president who refused to recognize the union. Uh, for the House, which is much larger, uh, we are nearing a majority. Um, and the Speaker of the House has yet to, I think, comment even on the union drive. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. But the executive and the judicial branches of the Massachusetts state government are both given uh, the opportunity, or are both afforded the right uh, to collectively bargain. We see no reason why legislative staff shouldn't have the same. Um, and so, you know, staff play a vital role in the operations of our state government. Um, helping staff helps Massachusetts residents, citizens, and taxpayers. So help us help you uh, is kind of what we're asking for. And I think Hamilton's book does a great job of illuminating just that, right? Um, you know, how unionism produces better results. Um, so, Great, thanks a lot. So before we get started, I wanna do two other quick shout outs. Um, this is sort of a point of personal privilege. One is I wanna shout out Beth Novak, the director of the Burn Center, without whom there would be no Power at Work blog and no event tonight. So Beth, thank you very much for being here. And, go ahead. Go ahead. That was a really tepid round of applause. That was an enthusiastic <laughs> round of applause for my boss. And, and this is really on a point of personal privilege. Um, 
Bob McCursey is the former dean of my alma mater, the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell, and was an outstanding, remarkable leader and really made that institution what it is today. So, Bob, so delighted to have you here. Thank you. Very much. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you which years he was the dean, but it wasn't. It, it, let me just I don't believe Joe Biden was president. Am I right, Bob? Mm -hmm. I don't think he was. President. Let me introduce our, our guest with my boy. He's had to wait a long time for this introduction. Uh, Hamilton Nolan is a longtime journalist and writer on labor and politics. He's also a union uh, activist. He's written for Gawker in these times, The Guardian, other outlets. And he has his own Substack newsletter titled How Things Work. And let me say, we're thrilled to welcome Hamilton here to Boston and to the Northeastern campus. Um, we're going to discuss his, I think, very important, timely, thought-provoking debut book, The Hammer, Power, Inequality, and the Struggle for the Soul of Labor. And let me start by saying we would have invited Hamilton to campus anyway because we love the book. It's a great book. I actually have been doing this for some 40 years been in the labor and employment world for about 40 years, and he taught me a bunch of things that I did not know and told me some stories that I hadn't heard before. But his book is pathbreaking and history-making in one extremely important regard that you may not be aware of. On page 191, Hamilton quotes an interview that we conducted on the Power at Work blog with Sarah Nelson on January 19th, 2023. This is the first ever book to quote the Power at Work blog. Now, he didn't mention that he was quoting the Power at Work blog, but he can fix that in the second edition, right? That's the thing. I could kind of look for paperback. Okay, I was going for second edition. Anyway, so that's our first ever quote in a book for the blog, and we were delighted to be able to offer it. Okay, so let me start with a, uh, a little bit about your background, Hamilton. Um, uh, You've come to focus so much of your career on labor and politics, uh, and you don't just write about it, you've been actually involved in it, and you talk about that at some length in the book. How did that happen? How did you get to be a labor journalist? And, and I want you to include the story about Gawker in talking a little bit about how you got to this point where you're a labor journalist activist. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Seth. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Northeastern. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Um, I grew up in Florida. I had sort of politically activist type parents who were involved in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and a little bit of communism um, back in the old days. So I grew up in that in that sort of household, um, hearing all those stories. And uh, when I became a journalist, I moved to New York and became a journalist, which I basically did because it was my only marketable skill. Um, I was working at a pizza restaurant before that. So it was like pizza restaurant or journalism. That was it. Um, but I, I didn't set out to be a labor journalist. I set out really just to answer basic questions that we all think about, like, why do the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? Why do rich people have all the power? You know, those things that we all think about in terms of why America is broken. And I found over the years, um, as I reported on those questions, more and more, I would come back to labor issues. And I would come back to issues of worker power and the decline of worker power. And over and over, I, I found myself being drawn back to labor issues as sort of the core of, of these problems. And so, you know, a after a while, you end up just becoming a labor journalist. Um, it, it can grab you like that. And uh, so in 2015, I was working at a website called Gawker, which used to exist, does not exist anymore, um, but was successful at one time. And uh, people used to ask us in the comments, when I would write about labor issues, people would ask us in the comments sometimes, why don't you have a union? I didn't really take it seriously. There really weren't unions in the online media industry. Uh, but in 2015, I had a conversation with a union organizer from the Writers Guild East, which had decided to try to unionize this new industry that was an up and coming industry at that time. Um, we did in fact successfully unionize Gawker uh, it was kind of the first big online media company to unionize. And after we did that, uh, there was kind of a union wave throughout the, the online media industry and really the media industry at large. That's still going today um, and has been really, really validating to see. Uh, so I got the chance to see, you know, the labor movement from both sides, both as a journalist reporting on it and also as somebody helping to organize my workplace. And also I got involved in my union and 
So I kind of got to see it from 360 degrees and, and got to see some of the ways it's broken also through that experience. You know, to talk about that, Thomas, I think you have the next one. So, you know, you tell that story about Gawker in the book. You tell another story that really resonated with me, which is the story of the child care workers in California um, who were significantly and uh, chronically undercompensated for uh, by the state for the work that they provide to low income families. Um, and this really reminded me of the Statehouse uh, Union Drive, which is in a, a similar situation where the body that we want to organize against is the body that first has to grant us the right to collectively bargain. Um, but as you say in the story, after two decades of organizing and advocacy, those workers in California eventually succeeded in changing the law to allow uh, child care workers the right to collectively bargain with the state. So what lessons should the broader labor movement uh, take away from that story? And can those lessons be applied everywhere? Or is it unique to California situation? Yeah, that was really one of the most inspiring, I think, uh, stories that I told in the book. And and let me say also for for the you know state house union, I said to Thomas before the event, but if you can't do this in fucking Massachusetts, where are you, <laughs> where are you going to be able to do this? So everybody, please yell at the uh, president of the <laughs> Massachusetts Senate about this if you get the chance. Um, but the the child care workers in California, this was this was a group of workers um, who take care of children in their homes. So they're in home child care workers. There's about 40,000 of them throughout the state of California, um, and two unions decided to unionize these workers. The first problem was it was illegal. They were not legally allowed to collectively bargain because they're, they're in a sense, they're all small business people in a way. They're, they're all autonomous, um, and they're taking care of low-income children, so they're paid by the state, as you touched on. The state gives subsidies to take care of low-income children. And the way the state of California decided how much to pay these childcare workers is that they did a bunch of surveys and figured out how much it costs to provide the childcare. And then they said, we will pay you 90% of that number. So they, they literally set the pay below the cost um, after doing surveys to find out what the cost was. So it was really egregious example of, of taking care of, of kids on the backs of the poor. Um, but you know, the story was inspiring and I included in the book because it was a 20 year long campaign. Um, there were people I interviewed whose mothers were there when they started the campaign, their mother retired and the daughter went into the industry and the daughter was there when they finally succeeded 20 years later. Um, they went through three, I think three or four different governors who kept vetoing the bill to allow them to collectively bargain. They finally succeeded in doing that after a 20 year long campaign. Um, pulling together this entire state, different people from all different countries. It was just a great example of what unions can do if they if they stick to it and if they think ambitiously, they think think of a big goal and stick to it. Um, multiple unions working together. I mean, there's a lot of things that we don't see enough in the labor movement that that really played out in that campaign, and the success of it, I think, is a testament to like what you can achieve if you think big and don't give up. So I, I want to turn to uh, the chapter of your book about South Carolina, which um, was at once disturbing and sort of inspirational. Uh, but I, I want to dig in on it with you a little bit. Um, so you, you tell a story in, uh, about a group of workers in South Carolina, and you characterize South Carolina, and I think maybe you were being too generous to them, as the most anti-union state mm. in America. And you describe the experience of one worker uh, an organizer at a plastics manufacturing facility named Gary McLean, who was, I mean, to say that he was subjected to vicious retaliation sort of doesn't capture it, right? He was involuntarily committed to a hospital as a supposed mental health risk because he was opposing his employer, right? Which is, I mean, you know, commitment to confinement without trial is, we're not supposed to do that here, right? That's what fascist states do. Um, but then I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit about the perspective that you brought to the story about South Carolina. So states like South Carolina seem to be the places where unions are least likely to be able to succeed, at least in the near term. But in this chapter, you seem to be arguing for the labor movement to invest more resources in South Carolina. So 
I, let me just ask it in an open-ended way. Is mm -hmm. that what you wanted us to take away from that chapter? Or was that just Hamilton Nolan, the compassionate, sympathetic guy who just didn't felt bad that these workers were feeling left alone? No, absolutely it was. And, and, you know, there's, there's a couple of reasons why a place like South Carolina is important. I mean, the reason I wrote a chapter about South Carolina is because, as you said, it's, it is the state with the lowest union density in the United States of America. So I believe under 3% of workers in that state are union members. Um, the entire South basically as a block is, is an anti-union region. It's politically anti-union. It's right. It's all right to work. Um, but South Carolina is the pinnacle. And so I want to go to kind of the worst place and be like, what is the labor movement like? What can the labor movement be in a place like South Carolina? Um, and, you know, I've reported on on labor all over the South. And you, you will hear a lot of people talk about the importance of organizing the South. And there is a, you know, there's an important strategic reason to organize the South, which is that Corporate America used the South in the same way they use Mexico or the same way they use offshoring. They go there to get away from labor regulations and they go there to get away from unions and they go there to tap into an economically desperate workforce with, you know, reactionary politicians who will who will favor the companies. And so, you know, it's bad for the for the power of organized labor in the entire country that we have this entire region where companies can flee to to shake off the power of labor. So that is like a standing strategic reason that we need to unionize the South period. Also, of course, that's where the most desperate and needy workers are that need the power of unions. Um, and unfortunately, I think there's a little bit of conventional wisdom in the union world that organizing down South is kind of a black hole. It's very difficult to organize. It's politically hostile. You can throw a lot of money at it and lose, as many unions have tried to do, um, including in South Carolina. They tried to organize a big Boeing factory and lost. And now the doors are falling off Boeing planes. So, you know, those things are not coincidental. Um, but but, you know, that conventional wisdom, I always remember. I wrote a story about the labor movement in Mississippi once, and I talked to the head of the AFL-CIO in Mississippi and he said, you know, just in my, he said, just in his spare time, he had organized the workers at a hotel in Jackson, Mississippi. And then he said he looked around for a union to take them and he couldn't find one union to accept these workers in the state of Mississippi. And that's how decrepit the state of organized labor is in the South. Like we don't, the infrastructure to take in these workers does not exist. And it doesn't exist because, you know, largely unions have not built it in the South. And part of the reason is because of that conventional wisdom that it can't be done. So it's a kind of circular version where as the labor movement gets weaker in this region, unions sort of want to disinvest from it because it seems like a too hard of a battle to fight, but it also gets that much more important um, to invest. So that's a long way of saying, and yes, we need the wall to invest down South. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I just had uh, I had uh, Jacob Morris and Adam Keller from the Valley yeah. Labor Report on the blog yeah. uh, to talk. We brought on a bunch of labor podcasters, including them, and they talked about how Alabama actually has now had two years, two consecutive years of union, not union density growth, but union membership growth, mm -hmm. and has one of the highest union density rates in the South, mm -hmm. and so it can be done. I just wondered whether South Carolina was the place to start. Although you tell, I mean, there are some inspirational people down there. You know, the ILA has hung on yeah. down there. Starbucks workers organizing in South Carolina. Right. There's a very strong, I mean, there's a, one, at least one super strong union in South Carolina, which is the long, the longshoremen um, at the port of Charleston, who are a longstanding union, very strong. They're, they, because they're in that port, which is internationally important, they, they kind of have an outsized level of power. And they've been able to use that to provide really good jobs for working class people in South Carolina for a long time. And in some ways, you know, I write about they kind of function as the social service agency that the state isn't. You know, the failures of southern states like South Carolina to take care of working class people, unions are the, the safety net that comes in and builds that thing that in in, you know, more effective state governments would have built themselves. And so the ILA is a place that can create these jobs where some people will point at them and be like, why, you know, longshoremen shouldn't be making six figures. This is inefficient. You know, you should be automated. 
But in fact, these are this is the social service agency in South Carolina. There's nobody else. Um, so seeing them is very inspirational, you know, and, and, and I think the next step for unions like that and for all unions is to think about projecting that power throughout southern states um as we've seen in alabama where the where the amazon first amazon warehouse campaign was and where the uaw's organizing now and throughout the south yeah all right i got one more and then thomas will uh, will ask a question i want to talk about uh i don't know if she's your friend but my friend sarah nelson yes uh sarah is the president of the association of flight attendants and she's featured prominently uh, in the book uh and you describe a uh, sarah as a, a I wouldn't. I don't know if you use the word revolutionary, but she's sort of a revolutionary, or certainly a charismatic and forward-leaning and progressive leader. Um, and and the the hypothesis that you put forward is that Sarah could have transformed the labor movement had she ascended to the presidency of the AFL-CIO. There was a period before Liz Schuler was elected president when there was an expectation, actually a fairly lengthy period, a couple of years, when the expectation was that Sarah would challenge Liz for that, that leadership role. And you say at the end of the book that, that Sarah is now, was at the time that you wrote the book, starting a new organization um, that would provide resources for new organizing and, and other changes that she might've implemented had she taken the leadership role mm -hmm. at the AFL-CIO, basically doing the, leading a reform effort from the outside rather than from the inside. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, you, you're not a defeatist about the labor movement. And I, I didn't want to read that story as you viewing that as a defeat, because I don't think that you did. But it's obvious that with your positivity and your optimism, you're disappointed that it turned out that way. I mean, you're not very you're not very shy about it in the book. Uh, you'll all see when you read the book. It's 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 pretty clear. So. Given that Sarah didn't win. Where do you think we are with respect to organizing and workers, and where do you think that we're going? Yeah, that's that's the big question, maybe at the heart of the book. I mean, I, I when I started reporting the book, it was it was a bit of an open question as to whether Sarah Nelson, who is for those of you who don't know, is that the head of the Association of Flight Attendants, a very sort of fiery and progressive, um, great speaker, very energetic, a person who you know, was one of the first labor leaders that I felt when I interviewed her, I was like this, she is saying the same things that I think about the labor movement, all the problems that I'm like, we need to do this. She was saying the same thing. So she's one of the more inspirational labor leaders. And had she become the president of the AFL-CIO, um, it could have been a transformative moment because that is the highest seat in the labor movement. Um, it would have sort of signaled maybe a, a a, trans, a mentally transformative shift in the way that the AFL-CIO sees itself. It didn't happen for various reasons that you can read about in the book. Um, but, you know, I think maybe the a more interesting question with Sarah Nelson that I've tried to think about is like just the, the aspect of being a leader of the labor movement. You know, we can think, you can think of union leaders and, and there are all types of leaders throughout, you know, unions all over America who are extremely, uh, uh, inspiring and and charismatic and great but to be a leader of the labor movement as a whole which is so disparate and spread out and all over the place and kind of you know falling down in certain places you know is such a thing even possible and i think that having those charismatic figures at the top i think of sarah nelson and also the a lot of you probably think of Sean Fain today from the UAW. Um, I, those are those are kind of the two people who I really think of are the labor leaders in the public eye. It is extremely important, just if nothing else, for the fact that people don't know about unions that much. I mean, people, unions, which have gone down to 10 percent uh, union density in America, most people do not have any personal connection to unions, period. And that hobbles organizing efforts everywhere. And so just the mere fact of having someone who can be on TV, who can be in popular culture, who can be on magazine covers, talking about unions, putting the union line out there is important and does move the needle. And, um, you know, the larger question of can we organize? I mean, we I could talk about that for a long time, um, but I do think that it's important that the central institutions of organized labor like the AFL-CIO get behind the idea that we need to turn around the decline in union density. And doing that means dramatically more, dramatically more 
uh, resources and money invested in organizing than we than we have now, you know, by a scale of 10. Um, and we fundamentally, we need ambition at the center of the labor movement. And I don't think we have that today. You see it in certain pockets, in certain unions, but you don't see it at the core of the labor movement. And that does hold us back. That's a perfect segue to Thomas's <laughs> question. Go ahead. Yeah. So speaking of AFL-CIO, you cover the AFL-CIO um, and the shortcomings of its strategies a lot in the book, uh, often in quite critical terms. Uh, and you state that the Federation should be leading the way on organizing. Uh, the state arm of the AFL-CIO, the Massachusetts AFL-CIO, I must say, has been a major supporter of uh, the Statehouse Union Drive, and we thank them dearly for all their support. Um, Statehouse staff and our union affiliate, IBW Local 2222, are the parties really doing the direct organizing work of our drive, though. Uh, so tell us why you think it would be better to have the AFL-CIO play a central role in worker organizing versus the unions themselves, maybe. Well, one, one thing I kind of discovered as a labor journalist um, was that I would I would interview all different union leaders and, you know, big union leaders, everybody, and the heads of the AFL-CIO. Um, and at the end of those interviews, I would always say, you know, what's the plan for turning around the big picture decline of unions? You know, not just your union, but like here we are, 50, 60, 60 to 70 years decline of union density in America. Um, which is a, a crisis that's, you know, I always compare it to climate change because it's a slow moving crisis, but it's leading us into disaster. It just goes at a slow enough pace that it can be easily ignored. But, you know, when I would ask these people, what's the plan to turn this around, which I thought of as the biggest question that the labor movement faces, really, it, nobody had a plan. And not only did nobody have a plan, but nobody really took the question seriously. Like, you know, they'd be kind of, it, it's like asking them how to change the weather. You know, they didn't think in those terms. And what I came to understand was that the labor movement, there is nobody in the world of organized labor who sees that as their job. You know, there's nobody in the world of, of unions who says, my job is the big picture. My job is the labor movement in America and to turn around union density for America. You know, union leaders think about their own unions. And so, you know, I, I am critical of the AFLCO because the AFLCO is, for better or worse, the central organization of unions in America. I mean, it just is. Like, that's a fact. So there it is. So they're the ones at the center. They're the ones who need to lead this. I don't think this is a question of of villainy or or of their, you know, of any of these people being bad people. I think that um, you know, what we need is uh, leadership of the labor movement that treats a crisis like a crisis. And the decline of union density in America is a crisis. We're at, uh, you know, every year they put out a report on union density, the, the BLS, and this year it's 10.0. So that's 0.1 away from single digits. And once you hit single digits, there's nowhere lower to go than that, you know? And, and in 1955, it was one in three workers, and now it's one in 10. I mean, we're getting our ass kicked um, and we have to, you know, the labor movement as a whole must be able to rally to this crisis um, and to approach it with the intensity that it demands. And so the, the splintered nature of the labor movement, where every union is concerned with its own lane, um, holds us back from that. And, and when I look at the reality of organized labor, you have to say, look, the AFL-CIO is the one institution that brings everybody to the table. And so if they can't sit down and strategically say, where are we gonna find the resources to do this? Let's assemble multi-union coalitions to do this. Let's start new unions in industries that are not unionized where we need to. Let's, you know, let's put together the funding streams for this. It's their job or nobody. So when I see them not doing it, I think it's it's a failure to rehearse all of this. Yeah, I won't. I, I'm not going to challenge you, but I'm going to. I'm not, and I'm not going to. I'm not even necessarily going to disagree. But I want to. I, I want to add in some of the conversations I've had with some union leaders because I think I think it's fair to say that there's no one person or group of people whose job it is to say all of this is our responsibility. But I, I've talked to a lot of union presidents, including on the blog, and I'll point to Brent Booker, the president of the Labor Union. And he went on the record, on the blog, I, I think it was the first time, saying, I'm going to double the size of my union in 10 years. Now, that's 500,000 new members in yeah. 10 years, which is, as you point out in, the, uh, in your book, 
the AFL-CIO commitment was a million new members in 10 years. So there's Brent taking half the burden <laughs> on himself. Yeah. But it's not just it's not just Brent and big unions. So we have we have some folks from uh, American Federation of Government Employees here, and I've talked to their president. And I'm not going to disclose what he said about numbers, but they're in an aggressive growth mode, and they're organizing aggressively. And the, the federal sector union unions are all growing now because they're organizing. And I talked to a bunch of organizers on the blog just uh, just the other day. Every one of them is getting called by workers. In, all over the place, in all kinds of industries, who want to organize, and they're trying to figure out how do they get their resources out there. So I, I think it's fair to ask the question, who's in charge of the whole thing? But there's lots and lots and lots of people in charge of big chunks of it. Mm -hmm. And and some of the old jurisdictional lines that used to be the excuse that you would hear, oh, that's not that's not my industry. I don't do that. I do autos. That's all I do. Well, the UAW organized Northeastern's graduate students, Right. The machinists are organizing in healthcare right yeah. now. So, so I'm I, I I wonder if having the AFL involved would would produce a better outcome than what we're seeing there. And you're doing a lot yeah. more reporting. I mean, I'm not reporting. I'm just talking to folks. No, I mean, there's there's definitely bright spots, and you know we should recognize those bright spots. And theoretically, if every union behaved like the UAW is behaving now, then theoretically we could get to where we need to get. Right. The problem is that that's not the case. I mean, you can look at um, what the UAW is doing, where, you know, not at, right after winning a huge strike, they said we're going to organize all of the non-union auto factories down south. You know, that is the kind of ambition we're going to they they allocated 40 million dollars a year um, new budget to organizing. Um, Sarah Nelson and the, the, the Association of Flight Attendants, her union is 50,000 members and they're organizing uh, Delta 28,000 new flight attendants at Delta. So that's more than a 50% growth rate of the union in one campaign, if they can pull it off. Um, not an easy campaign, but like that that is the scale of ambition. And so, yes, if every union had that level of commitment, um, we, might, we might solve this problem. I think the problem is that that commitment as it exists today is mostly ideological. So you see it from union, mem from, from union leaders who really are true believers in the labor movement and have a sort of ideological commitment to that kind of organizing. But as you know, that's not every union leader and that's not every union. And so there are other, I just wrote a story in In These Times Magazine about UFCW, which is one of the biggest private sector unions in America, grocery industry union, among other things, um, and the internal reform effort going on there because the union is not organizing and they're not spending money. So Yes, I mean, I guess maybe we're going to have to do it union by union, but it might take a while. Yeah, yeah. all good things take a little while, true, at least. You can stay up to date with the latest news about workers, worker power, and unions by subscribing to the Power Work blog. You'll receive the weekly download of Power Work newsletter sent straight to your inbox. The weekly download collects about 2,000 of books, articles, academic studies, press releases, podcasts, and videos. You can across the internet. We find the stories and deliver them directly to you. So subscribe to the weekly download right now on the front page of the Power at Work blog. Go to poweratwork.us. Okay, so I want to ask you about one of the unions that I know you really admire, and I, I share that admiration, and that's Unite Here. Um, the, you tell a really inspiring story about Unite Here in Las Vegas. Um, they're, a, they're a really innovative union. They're an impactful union. They represent hundreds of thousands of workers, most of them, many of them, in the service and hospitality industries. Tourism, as you point out in the book, is really crucial to their, their strategy. And, and, you know, tourism is a big part of Boston's strategy yeah. as well. And so they're prominent here. Let me just, uh, if you don't mind, I want to shout out uh, Unite Here Local 26, represents the dining hall workers on the Northeastern campus. They just got an unbelievable contract for their members, a, a tremendous success, really yeah. a historic contract. Uh, so congrats to Local 26 and delighted to have them partnered with us on a whole bunch of things. Um, so uh, again, looking for the kinds of success stories that Thomas was talking about before, what lessons can we learn? What lesson do you learn from Unite Here and their success? And what do you think is keeping them from succeeding more broadly? Mm -hmm. I wrote, uh, there's two chapters about Unite here in the book. Um, 
one chapter is about the Culinary Union in Las Vegas, which is uh, sort of famous for being, you know, one of the strongest local unions in the United States of America. The, they have, you know, the entire casino industry essentially is in um, the Culinary Union. Um, and and just I write about the way they kind of built up that power over the course of eight years, which is which essentially comes down to organizing everybody. Every casino got to be in the union. And if it's not, they're going to organize it. Striking when they need to strike, you know, they fight. And if they need to strike, they strike. And they had the frontier strike, which was six, a six year long strike, which they call they, they say it was the longest strike in America. I don't know how to verify that, but it's a very long time to be on strike six years. But so constant new organizing, always being willing to fight and to strike and constant internal organizing where they're always mobilizing their own members and they're always engaging their members and they're keeping them mobilized and ready and ready to go knock on doors for politicians if they need to. And so, so it's a good example of how you start by organizing labor power and you turn it into political power. And that kind of direction of thinking about achieving political power for the working class through labor organizing and not by trying to cater to politicians. I think it's such an important um, example that, that all of us can learn from. And then I read another chapter about sort of some of the efforts in other cities to see like, can we duplicate what we did in Vegas in other cities? And so I read about New Orleans and Miami, which, which both have certain similarities to Vegas, nowhere is exactly like Vegas, but you know, the idea still is that if you can organize in a tourist city and you can go organize the hotels and you can organize the stadiums and the airport, and the convention centers and those sort of nodes of the tourist economy, you can really leverage a lot of power for working people by, by being strategic like that. Um, so Unite Here is just a union that does that well. And I think that we can all learn a lot from them. They're not a huge union, 300,000-ish um, total. So, I mean, and, you know, I talked a lot to some of the leaders there about you know, you guys have such a great formula. Like, why don't you scale this up? I mean, the formula is there. They know how to go into a city and organize these industries and and build power like that. So then you're like, why isn't this everywhere? And it comes down to a resource question. I mean, they almost went broke during the right. pandemic, for one thing, because their entire workforce was out of work. I mean, 90, high 90 percent unemployment during the pandemic. Um, so it's a resource question. And, and you know, it, it for a lot of unions, it's a resource question, and I think it it raises for the broader labor movement also the question of like, how do we marshal resources to duplicate things that work like the formula? Yeah, no, that's an excellent argument, I think. So, Thomas and I are going to tag team you on this one. <laughs> so you are going to have to swivel a little bit <laughs> on this one. Um, so throughout the book, in fact, you might say this is one of the meta themes of the book, is you talk about the need for workers and unions to be more militant, to fight. You actually just were talking about it just now. Um, and you, one of the stories where you sort of crystallize that is when you talk about a group of workers uh, at a Nabisco manufacturing plant in Portland, Portland, Oregon, who had very good jobs. And then like millions of workers across America, the employer started to squeeze them, use the threat of offshoring and other things to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Um, and for those workers, for the Nabisco workers in Portland, it was a really radicalizing experience. I think it's fair to say that. I'm yeah. sure you'd agree with that. Um, and so those workers, maybe before that, never thought they would need to fight. But they learned that the only way that they were going to be able to, to keep what they had or even some semblance of what they had was to engage in a fight. But that's not the experience of every worker in America, right? So. My sense is that fighting is a tactic, not a goal, right? And Thomas, I know you have a, an insight into this from your experience with the state house employees. Yeah, I mean, my question is, can we expect enough workers to engage in militant behavior? I mean, political staff by nature are quite diplomatic. Mm -hmm. um, and they know, you know, their boss personally a lot of times. They're all sitting very quietly, you know, <laughs> yeah. so very politely here tonight. Um, and, you know, they know their boss personally a lot of times. They choose to work for them because uh, they want to serve their specific goals to, you know, make a, a positive difference in the world. So they don't have the same sense of class war. Um, but even private sector workplaces, you know, many people just 
really don't want to be at war with their boss or with their company. They they like their job. They're the Nabisco workers like their job. Um, so are you at all concerned that the need to fight could be off-putting to too many workers? Yeah, well, I can answer this a couple of ways. I can answer it um, first, like in my personal experience as a as an organizer, um, this is it's certainly something you encounter in any organizing campaign. And when we first started organizing in media, you know, we would have meetings with all these people and, and unions were a very new idea for us in that industry as they are maybe in, in your industry too. And so when you had those meetings, you would always kind of be like, they'd be like, are we going to have to strike? And you'd be like, no, no. Like you're trying to make it sound as easy and smooth as possible, you know, because you're trying to sort of seduce these people into it who are very touchy. Um, and, and so that was kind of the way I had a lot of the early conversations. And then a few years down the road, places started to have big fights. And I was like, we shouldn't have said that uh, you weren't going to have to strike. That was, that was actually a mistake. Um, because we had, we had set the bar a little low. So I actually came to understand more and more of the time um, in my own industry that like actually, you know, you need to be more upfront with these people. Now, people can be skittish, yes. But, you know, I try to tell people that unions are a basic right, uh, a civil right, essentially, a human right. You have the right to a union. You have the legal right to a union. You should not feel guilty about it. You, it is not an affront to your boss. You know, many of us are friends with our boss. It's not an argument. It's not an affront to your boss. The basic right in the workplace, you're allowed to have it. Nobody can take it away. Nobody should take it away. And, you know, if somebody is going to step on your basic rights, you have to fight back or you're going to lose them. And that's what it comes down to. I mean, and, and, and union organizers will tell you this, you know, at, at a certain point, your workers will either fight or you'll get your ass kicked. And that's, you know, that's life. That's reality. And I will say as answering the question, maybe as a journalist, as a labor journalist, you know, I can look across all the unions that I've written about over the years and the strong unions fight. The strong unions fight, you know, Sean Fain, he came in and and within a few months was on strike against the entire auto industry, not just one company, the whole industry and one. You know, and now he's he's, you know, he's uh, organizing off the strength of that. I mean, the culinary union in Vegas, every every, you know, the casino industry has been trying to kill that union for 80 years. They've been trying to break that union for 80 years. And every fight they get in is an existential fight, because if they lose, that is a sign to the casino industry. They don't have to deal with with union work and it's going to break the union. So, I mean, those strong unions fight and. One way or another, you can be diplomatic about it if you want, but you have to get the point across to workers that if you don't fight for yourself, um, you're going to get stepped on, and there's no way around. Public professionals, would you like to learn how data, digital, innovation, and AI skills can improve your work and help you serve your constituents better? The answer is Innovate US. Innovate US offers no-cost learning on the skills you need to succeed in government in the 21st century. Attend a one-hour weekly workshop or enroll in a course on AI or human-centered design at your own pace. It's all free to you. Visit innovate-us.org today to learn more and sign up. That's innovate-us. Visit right now. That is a terrific place for us to turn to our in-person audience for any questions that you may have. Now, I'm going to give you a little warning. We're recording. So when I walk over to you with the microphone, I'm going to ask you to wait. If you have a question, ask you to wait until I get there with the microphone. You're going to be on camera, and it's going to be part of the broadcast if we're able to put this thing together, which I hope we will. Um, so we're going to ask you just to give your name, and if you'd like to offer an organizational affiliation, you're welcome to. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, but let me open the floor to questions from the audience. Okay. I'm James Cordero, Boston Teachers Union. Anyone who likes working with kids and wants to be involved in the labor movement, talk to me after. The BTU has great opportunities for you. But, Hamilton, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, you talk about the AFL-CIO. They need to reform it to do more new organizing. I'm skeptical of that. They don't have any binding power over the member affiliates. The UAW's budget is far bigger than the AFL-CIO's. That got reform leadership and now is spending $40 million over the next two years to do new organizing. Why shouldn't we just try to reform the other big unions like the NEA, AFT, National nurses and use their budgets, which are all considerably larger. 
Well, uh, you're not the only one that's skeptical of it. I think uh, I, I, generally people in the labor movement kind of think that AFL-CIO is sort of a sideshow. And um, I'm probably in minority for uh, even believing that the AFL-CIO is worth reforming. So it's not an uncommon opinion. Um, and, you know, I would say we should try to reform the big unions. I mean, that that work is important. And that's what happened at UAW. Just, you know, for the most obvious example, they had an internal reform movement and now look at what they've done. So those efforts are really important. I don't think that's the only fights that are important, though. I mean, I, for better or worse, I believe that organized labor needs a center in America. It needs some kind of center. And if the AFL-CIO is weak and there is no coordination between unions, we have to do, we have to be able to pull off things with multiple unions, coordinating national campaigns, we can't organize Amazon with one union. You know, we can't organize the tech industry with one union. There are big, big things in the context of global capitalism that we cannot do with one union, no matter how good the union is. We have to be able to, to coordinate our power um, on a national scale, an international scale. And, that, and the AFL-CIO is the institution that is best placed to do it. So as disappointing as they can be, and I don't... I. Uh, I'm not surprised you asked the question, but envision a better day. <laughs> okay. Stand up. Or no, you can stay right here. I think so. Okay. has got us. Go ahead. Uh, I'm David Whitford uh, with uh, Unite Here. Um, this this question feeds off your, your your last point about unions that are willing to fight. Um, if I have to read one more time about how popular unions are today, <laughs> right? They're like most. The Gallup poll, the annual Gallup poll says we're up around 60 or 70 percent approval for labor unions. I just want to test this theory with you. Um, my feeling is we don't need popular unions. We need unions that people are afraid of. That's when the labor movement has made its biggest gains. Yeah, we need unions that businesses are afraid of, for sure. <laughs> I think we want to be popular with the workers and, and scary to the businesses. Um, so... I mean, I, I take those polls as like good in the sense that that provides fertile ground for new organizing or should provide fertile ground for new organizing, or at least more fertile ground than people not liking unions. So it's it's sort of one of the elements of raw material that make this moment that we're in right now so promising. Um, and, you know, the most promising moment probably for union organizing in my lifetime and, and maybe in your lifetime, depending on how old you are. Um, and and it's another reason why we need to kind of strike while the iron is hot right now. I mean that those polls fluctuate, you know, and a lot of that is coming out of the pandemic and workers having horrible experiences through the pandemic and being somewhat radicalized by that experience and wanting something better. So still nationally, there's a there are tens of millions of workers who are at least in the mindset of wanting something better in the workplace, and that's something unions can take advantage of. But yes, then we should be scary after that. Uh, can I just follow up? I'm going to follow up on David's question because I thought it was a really good one. Uh, and your answer, which I also thought was a really good one. Um, what, is it, what, what is the consequence of unions getting a, I think they're at 67% favorability. They got up to 71% the Gallup poll. Does it mean there's a lot more workers who want to join a union? Or does it mean that there's a bunch of people who will support unions if they do the things they need to do to build their power. Or maybe it means that and other things. Tell me what you think it means. Well, I think it means a very vague thought on the part of most people. I mean, most people, you know, we it, sitting in this room are in a bubble. I mean, the union bubble. And I this was I really noticed this when I first, you know, became a part of a union and got involved in a lot of labor movement stuff. You know, I would go into rooms and you'd be in the union bubble and everybody in the union bubble is like union, union, union all the time. But then you walk down the street to the gas station. I always think about when I go home to Florida and I go to the gas station, I'm like, what has the labor movement done for the person in this gas station? Nothing. And what do they know about unions? Nothing. So it's a, I think it's a, it represents a vague feeling of wanting something better at work. You know, probably people have seen some union stuff on TV, Amazon and Starbucks, and they think it's good. Um, I think it's something to be capitalized on, but if we don't capitalize on it, I don't think it's going to mean very much. So um, your name, and if you want to tell us an organization, uh, sure. My name is Ryan. I'm unfortunately not thinking. 
organization. Now. That's okay. But um, so you did talk a bit about trying to unionize the South. Well, we know that's always um, been kind of been historically weak area for organizing, but I just want to know your opinion on what you think the most promising like region of America is for like any future unionization efforts, if you can give one. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting because there's really uh, you can really see, especially if you follow state level politics. Um, I mean, the red states are getting worse, and the blue states are getting better in some cases. Uh, you know, more pro labor in the blue states and worse in the red states. Georgia just passed a law that makes it illegal to get state money if you voluntarily recognize a union. So you cannot voluntarily recognize a union, and Alabama is replicating that law, and Louisiana is about to break the public unions. So you see the red states going more to the right, and I think you're going to see a lot of blue states, especially Illinois and states like Massachusetts, going going further in the opposite direction. So, I mean, analytically, you would say the blue states are getting friendlier and friendlier to unions and probably easier to organize and maintain power in, and the red states are getting more hostile. But as we talked about before, you know, that doesn't mean you can give up on the red states, because if you do, it saps power from everybody else, too. Who else would like to get into the conversation? Okay, Beth, you're going to have to meet me halfway. My court only goes so far. <laughs> Gathered here. I have. I actually wanted to ask a personal question. This is Beth oh. Novak, the director of the Burns Center. I, I'll I, introduce her. <laughs> She's the only one who gets that, by the way. I've twice introduced now. I actually wanted to ask a personal question about you and the evolution of your career as a labor journalist and what that has meant and what the receptivity has been to having this beat, how difficult or easy that's been, whether with the change in policy and change in time. There's just obviously the congratulations on the book. Uh, but the question is, how, what has it meant for the evolution of your career? How has journalism and that industry kind of responded to this area of focus? Of course, they didn't have the Powered Work blog to tell them this was an important <laughs> topic for such a long time. So I'm just curious whether you've seen uh, a lot of pushback or what's been the, your personal experience. In the field. Yeah. It's not a good way to get rich. Um, <laughs> but I, I think one, one thing... One interesting thing we saw as we unionized a lot of the media industry over the past six, seven, eight years um, is that you had thousands of journalists going through union drives of their work, and then consequently they became more interested in labor issues. So you've seen actually kind of an upsurge um, in labor reporting in all types of outlets, I think, as a result of just thousands of reporters going through that in their own lives and becoming more interested in labor issues. And that's that has been good um, for the labor movement. I mean, I remember in 10 years ago when Steve Greenhouse, who was the New York Times labor reporter, retired, people were like, this is it, man. Labor journalism is done. This is the last guy out the door, and we're going to turn off the lights. And, um, and there's definitely been a revival since then. Again, I think t really tied to the union unionization of the media industry. Um, but, you know, the cap on that is that now um, – the economic model of journalism has kind of been broken by the by the tech platforms, and so all these unionized journalists are now getting laid off. And so I think you're gonna you're gonna see this going down again um, because the the industry is just completely broken. And so I think that the public appetite for labor journalism is high. I mean, for every labor story I write, there's at least ten other stories that I could write but don't. So there's still we could absorb hundreds more labor journalists. There's tons of stories out there. There's tons of stuff to write. Um, but just about every labor journalist I know does it because they believe in the labor movement. And most of them are self-employed, which is another way to say unemployed. Um, you know, and so it's, it's, you know, it's an area that is ripe for some kind of support from nonprofits or from some kind of civil society because you know, the economic model of journalism is broken. I don't know where the labor journalism is going to come from for the next 10 years, honestly. All right. I got I got one of the OG labor scholars Thanks. who's got a question for you, Bob. Yeah, Bob McCursey. This is a terrific book. I wish I could get my colleagues in business school before I've hung out most of my life uh, to read it. And that then goes to the employer side of the equation. As you know, they're well organized. Uh, they spend a lot of money on union avoidance campaigns. They spend a lot of money on positive things. 
trying to make the workplace, you know, in a sense, more productive. How do you, in a sense, deal with that reality? Because that's part of the decline that we've been experiencing. Um, that's a big, big driver of decline, you know, historically, is starting in, I think, probably the 60s and, and into the 70s, you know, the, the, and the union busting industry became very professionalized. And, and it's obviously very hard to organize unions today. I write in the book about a guy named Felix Allen in New Orleans, who was just a young guy who tried to organize his Lowe's hardware store where he worked. Lowe's, a $100 billion company, zero unions. This basically kid just tried to unionize his Lowe's. He, he got union cards signed. He filed for an election. And then Lowe's parachuted in the anti-union busting team of lawyers and managers and ended up um, getting it thrown out. And Felix ended up getting fired. And it highlighted to me, uh, you know, something that I, I think about a lot, which is that, you know, unions have to, we have to be as organized as the businesses are, right? And, you know, we talked about before, like, being able to pull together big things. I mean, we can't expect to organize a trillion dollar company with a bunch of volunteers. You know, we have to be as professional as the people that we're fighting. And um, there's there's a quote that Sarah Nelson says a lot. It's a Mother Jones quote that I cannot remember word for word. But essentially, she said, you know, uh, the bosses say there's no need for organizing, but they themselves are continually organizing, which shows the truth. Um, so you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, great questions from the audience, as I knew they would be. Um, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's conversation. Please join me in thanking Hamilton Nolan. I have special thanks to Thomas Pelkey and the Massachusetts State House Employees Union. And again to Jeff Novak and the Burn Center for Social Change. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the people who actually made this happen. I just sort of show up and read off the screen. Um, but uh, Dane Gambrell, and Joseph and Aubrey and Sanjana and Bonnie, they're the people who really made this happen. So please give them a breath. Now, the people who are watching on the blog already know this, but for the people in the room, you can find the Power at Work blog at poweratwork.us. And when you get there, please subscribe and ask your friends and union siblings to subscribe as well. We will keep you updated about all of our content, by the way, including a great piece by Ben Sachs, which was originally published in the On Labor blog, which we just republished, which is exactly about the laws that you were just talking about that are anti-union laws. And his argument is the folks who are propounding those laws, ALEC, this right-wing advocacy organization, had better be careful because if those laws withstand uh, judicial review, there's a bunch of pro-union laws that are going to also withstand union review, uh, 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 judicial review, and that would actually be a good thing, maybe, in some cases. So please go subscribe to the Power at Work blog. Get your friends and colleagues and union siblings to do the same thing. In addition to us updating you every week on the content on the blog, we will send you the weekly download, which is a collection of a couple of dozen articles, opinion pieces, uh, a lot of Hamilton stuff is in there, uh, videos, stuff on the internet that's about workers, worker power, collective action, and unions. Uh, now, for our live audience, we have copies of The Hammer, available for sale in the back of the room at a 20% discount. And if you ask him very nicely, I think Hamilton might be willing to sign your book. So after we break, I encourage you to go back. We only have a few copies, so you're gonna to have to snap them up pretty tight. I saw some people bought them before the event even started because they're, they're, re they're really smart and wanted to make sure that they got one. For folks at home, go buy The Hammer. It's a terrific book very entertaining. You'll learn a lot. You'll be energized as we are by the stories about union organizing around the country. But let me encourage you to buy it from a, a, a union bookstore, maybe an independent unionized bookstore, not from some online, where, online warehouse company. Just a suggestion. Thank you all for participating tonight. Thanks to everybody at home. Have a good Thanksgiving.
Power at Work blog is a project of the Burns Center for Social Change at Northeastern University. The Burns Center develops innovative, participatory, and equitable approaches to solving public problems using new technology. Our faculty and fellows are accomplished, nationally recognized change makers. Interested in learning more? Go to burns.northeastern.edu and sign up for our mailing list. And you can follow us on social media at Burns Center on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. The Burns Center for Social Change, from demanding change to making it.